Everybody say, thank God, thank God. For, the for the Holy Spirit. Because without him, without him. We're, left on our own, we're left on our own. And that's not a good thing. Amen. Okay, let's jump in. All right, we're starting a new series here today. This is the introduction. It's a carryover from last week. How many of you were here last Sunday, last weekend, at some point, Friday night, Saturday night, Sunday? Let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. Okay, you were part of a milestone. Last week, we broke every record in the 27-year history of this church. Uh, for the week of Easter, we saw 2,147 people come to services, either here either here or in, in our campus at Bayville or our campus at Wall, it was, we just broke every record, just Thank free. God. And so many dozens of people got saved and lifted their hands to receive Christ and prayed that prayer of salvation. And so please, God is moving. God is moving. Do you understand this, okay? May, maybe you're not experiencing it yet because maybe you, you got to jump in. You got to jump in. Turn to somebody, say jump in and you'll experience Turn to somebody else, say, he's moving. He's moving. And say this now, I declare by faith, I declare by faith that, he's in my life. that he's moving in my life. In Jesus' name. In Jesus name. Amen. 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 Get ready to rock. Amen. <laughs> so, this series was dropped in my heart about two, maybe over two months ago. And uh, I purposely, you know, because when you're a pastor or a minister or any kind of minister, Every time you read the Bible, you start, you go to read, and you know, I try to read for myself. And then I come across something, go, oh, man, I need to teach that. <laughs> so I literally stopped keeping a notebook with me when I just read for myself, so it would stop that. But every once in a while, the Holy Ghost just goes, no, yeah, you need, boom. Good. And so a couple of months ago, I literally heard this title, and as soon as I heard the title, I knew exactly what it was going to be. It was Out of the Shadows. Out of the Shadows. And this has to do with Jesus. It doesn't have to do with us. It has to do with him. Because in the Old Testament, you see what's called types and shadows of Jesus. And I'm teaching this because here's the goal. I want us to understand that he is so much more than a little baby in the manger. I want us to understand that he's so much more than a broken body on the cross. Amen. That he is the Jesus of eternity, Amen. the Messiah of eternity. Okay, you need to understand that. Because I, I think there's too many Christians that put him in this little box Born in Bethlehem, went to the cross, that's it. No, Jesus always is, Amen. always was, always will be. And I, I'm believing God that our goal that we're going to accomplish in the next few weeks, maybe we'll go the rest of the month of April with this, I don't know exactly, okay, that we're going to see Jesus, like he's going to get revealed to us like he's never been revealed before. Thank God. Amen? Amen. Amen. Now, now, I'm going to give you something ahead of time. I'm going to give you something ahead of time, okay? I, we may get into this, whatever. The Apostle John, one of the most blessed of all the disciples, and I'll tell you why. He got to experience Jesus in his natural body. Remember? Okay? He's the one who, he laid his, his head on Jesus' shoulder at the Last Supper. I mean, you've got to be close to somebody, to, especially uh, if you're a guy. Okay? Right. But then, watch this now. Years later, he got to experience Jesus in his majesty of all eternity when he saw him on the Isle of Patmos, when he received that vision of the Lord Jesus Christ. So, so we're going to get into some of that today. But let's, let's start. We're going to pick up from last week. What was last week? Easter. 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 Resurrection. Okay, here we go. Uh, 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 last week, we were all laughing among the staff because we'd go up in the lobby and say, Happy Easter, and the person would go, Oh, Happy Resurrection Day. And if you say Happy Resurrection Day, you go, Happy Easter. So which way do you want it? <laughs> It's, look, we know, it's, we know what Easter means. We're not, we're not pagans. We're not worshiping bunny rabbits. We're not worshiping Easter eggs. We understand that stuff, okay? But it's the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Luke chapter 24, let's go. We're going to go back to that Sunday afternoon. Luke chapter 24, verse 13. You want to put that back on now, see if it works? You got to come up here to do it? Oh, all right, never mind then. Okay. Uh, by next Sunday, we'll have that fixed. Amen, Chris? <laughs> Amen, Chris? Okay, good. Luke chapter 24, verse 6. You know, I'm glad this happened, because now this side over here, we're going to say, well, I should have brought my Bible today. <laughs> so get, if you get your Bible app, get on your phone. Get, get, yeah. If you got it, wave it. Go ahead. 
please bring your Bibles to church. It's something so important. It's just something that happens when you see it yourself on your page for you. Okay? Bring it to church. People gave their lives to protect this thing. Luke chapter 24, verse 13. I'm going to read to you from the New Living Translation. That same day, two of Jesus' followers were walking to the village of Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. So figure from here to Route 37, to the intersection of Route 37 and Hooper Avenue. Okay? Not that far for us, but for them, seven miles from Jerusalem. As they walked along, they were talking about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things, Jesus himself suddenly came and began walking with them. Now, this is the Sunday afternoon of the resurrection, okay? But God kept them, the two disciples, the two followers of Jesus, God kept them from recognizing him. He asked them, I love, I love the, re the reality of who Jesus. I love his sense of humor. I love his realness. He asked them, what are you discussing so intently as you walk along? They stopped short. Sadness written across their faces. Then one of them, Cleopas, replied, you must be the only person in Jerusalem who hasn't heard about all these things that have happened there these last few days. We would say today, did you grow up in a cave? How did you not know? Did you grow up in the woods? How did you not know what happened, okay? So understand the perspective that they're coming from. All right. And Jesus replies, verse 19, what things? I love that. The things that happened to Jesus. Now watch this now. The man from Nazareth. Now let me, let me read this and then we'll go back over this. The things that happened to Jesus, the man from Nazareth, they said. They said. They, say they said. They said. He was a prophet who did powerful miracles and he was a mighty teacher in the eyes of God and all the people. Okay, God bless you. Now, watch this now. What things, Jesus asked, they reply, the things that happened to Jesus, the man from Nazareth, they said, he was a prophet who did powerful miracles and he was a mighty teacher in the eyes of God and all the people. Now, let me just walk you through some stuff here, how you accurately divide the word of truth, how you accurately discern the scriptures. Is it true that these men said this. Let's go over it again. The things that happened to Jesus, the man from Nazareth, is it true that they said that? Yes. yes. Is it true that they said that he's a prophet and did miracles and he's a mighty teacher in the eyes of God and all the people? Is it true they said that? Yes. But is it true that that's all who Jesus is? No. no. So understand this about Scripture. Scripture records everything that takes place. It does not mean that whatever it says is always true. This was the, these men's opinions about Jesus. Watch this now. There's a reason I'm saying this. Why? Because these men are distraught. They are sad. They are disappointed. They are heartbroken. All the hopes that they pinned on this man in their eyes have been shattered. So we're hearing from people who are not thinking accurately. Are you getting this? Yes. No, because I don't want, you know, because people throughout the centuries would take a scripture like this and build a completely different doctrine about who Jesus is. Well, you see, he's only a man. The Bible says, no, the guys said he's only a man. Yeah, yeah. The Bible's recording the conversation. Just like in the book of Job. Job says, well, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. No, is that true about God? No, but people go, well, you know, Job said, well, Job said. It's recorded that Job said, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Amen. It's not true that the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away, because God doesn't play mind games. Amen. Are you getting this? Yes. We're good. Yes. You understand it now. Yes. Okay, because you'll see this as we keep going. Next verse. But our leading priests and other religious leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. Next verse. Here we go. Watch the disappointment level now. Watch the disappointment level now. We had hoped he was the Messiah. So at one point, they believed that he was a Messiah. At one point, okay, now this, these two guys, which most Bible commentators believe, they were not part of the original 12, 
but they were probably part of the 70 and almost certainly part of the 500 that saw Jesus risen from the dead at the same time that Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Are you following me? Yes. Now, now, watch this now. Peter believed that Jesus was the Son of God. Yes? yes? yes. Who do men say that I am? Okay, you remember that whole thing. I don't have time to go into it. Matthew chapter 16. Don't have time to go into it. So, so I would believe that they believed, as Jesus being the Messiah, that he was also the Son of God. Now, because of the disappointment, he went from the Son of God to the man from Nazareth. Because of the disappointment, he went from the Son of God in their eyes to a prophet, a good teacher. Be careful that when you suffer disappointments that you don't take God down a couple of pegs. Amen. Are you getting this? If you don't learn anything else today, learn this. Because that's what these guys did. Amen. And I got a feeling that's why Jesus joined them on the road to Emmaus because we're going to see a complete turnaround. Watch this now. Go ahead, next verse. Then some women from our group of his followers were at the tomb this early this morning and they came back with an amazing report. They said the, his body was missing. His body wasn't missing. His bo- the, the tomb was empty, but his body wasn't missing. Jesus knew exactly where his body was. Yeah. Okay. They had seen angels who told them Jesus is alive. Keep going. Some of our men ran out to see, talking about Peter and John, and sure enough, his body was gone, just as the woman said. Keep going. Then Je- now Jesus speaks up. Now Jesus is going to, he lets them talk, just like he lets us vent. Oh, God, oh, God, why, God, why, God? He lets us vent, and then he steps in. Say, thank God he steps in. And Jesus said to you foolish people, you find it so hard to believe all the prophets wrote in the scriptures. Next verse. Wasn't it clearly predicted? What's he doing? He's getting them back on track. Wasn't it clearly predicted that the Messiah would have to suffer all these things before entering his glory. Yeah, I could think of two places right now. Isaiah 52, Isaiah 53. Okay, next verse. Oh, excuse me. Then Jesus, this is what we're going to do for the next four weeks. This is what we're going to do. Literally what Jesus said. Then Jesus took them through the writings of Moses, which would be what? The first five books of the Bible, what, what, what in Judaism calls the Torah. So he starts with the first five books and all the prophets explaining from all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Now, if you keep reading in this same chapter, which I'm not going to do for the sake of time, he then again says that when they had time, they sat and, and he explains Moses, the five books of Moses, the Torah, the prophets, and then Jesus adds the Psalms, which pretty much makes up all of what we call Old the Old Testament. That's what we're going to do. We're going to stick with the Old Testament. We're going to stick. I like to call it the first covenant. Yes. Amen. Yes. I think it's kind of disrespectful to call it the old. And it's the first covenant, second covenant. Right. Mm-hmm. Now, we know the second covenant, we're told, is a new covenant with new and better promises. Amen. But listen, the first covenant is pretty good, too. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to allow the scriptures to speak to us and explain to us that Jesus did not start in Bethlehem. I don't know what it is with us, especially if you come to the Catholic background that I did. Baby Jesus, baby Jesus. Baby Jesus grew up. (laughs) Oh, let's go pray to baby Jesus. No, baby Jesus grew up. Would you turn to somebody and remind them, baby Jesus grew up. (laughs) Okay, you got this? Are we clear? Yeah, clear. All right, good. So, verse 28. By this time they were nearing Emmaus, and at the end of their journey, Jesus acted as if he was going, as he was going on. But they begged him, stay the night with us since it's getting late. Now, remember we're talking about ancient times. Remember we're talking about in uh, in the Middle East. There's no electric lights. There's no, I, I don't think they had police forces on the roads. You took your life in your hands if you traveled by night in the darkness because bandits, you got animals, you got all kinds of stuff that can happen to you. So they are taking natural s- security because they don't really know who they're talking to, okay? And so they went there, they begged him, and stay the night with us since it's getting late. So he went home with them. As they sat down to eat, he took, oh, I love this part. He took bread 
and blessed it, and then he broke it and gave it to them. And suddenly, look at, look at, and suddenly their eyes were opened and they recognized him. And at that moment, he disappeared. Really? Now that we know who you are, now you disappear? <laughs> they probably, the first thing they probably thought was, man, if I knew who this was, we would have had more than a peanut butter and jelly sandwich here. Verse 32 is so important because this is what I believe we're going to experience. Then they said to each other, didn't our hearts burn within us as he talked with us on the road and explained the scriptures to us? Now watch this. Revelation will cause you to take action that you normally would not. What's the next thing to happen? And within the hour, they're on their way back to Jerusalem. Wait a minute. I thought it was dark out. I thought it was dangerous. I thought there's bandits. I thought there's wild animals. They didn't care. Because when you get a revelation of Jesus, there's a boldness that comes on you. That you'll do stuff that you normally wouldn't do. You listening? Where was I? Okay. And there they found the 11 disciples and the others who had gathered with them, who said, the Lord has really risen. He appeared to Peter. Then the two from Emmaus told their story how Jesus had appeared to them as they were walking along the road and how they had recognized him as he was breaking the bread. And just as as they were telling about it, Jesus himself suddenly uh, uh, standing there, was suddenly standing there among them. Pete, look at the first thing he says to them. Peace be with you. Shalom Aleichem. Peace be with you. you, I I don't think you understand what that means. Why? Why are they in this room? They're scared to death. They figured if they crucified him, they're coming after us next. They're scared to death. Who knows if they're having panic attacks, anxiety attacks. And what's the very first thing that Jesus says to them? Shalom. Shalom, which is way more than peace. Shalom is way more than peace. Shalom is peace, calm, stability, restoration, calm down, take a deep breath. You getting this? So, why is it important for us to learn this now? Because this is the first time in 27 years I'm teaching this. Now, there's some elements that you're going to recognize from other past teachings, but this is the first time I'll be putting together this entire chain of this is Jesus, and 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 this is Jesus. Why now? The whole, thank you. The Holy Ghost reminded me this past week, when I really started putting this all together for today, for this weekend, about the words that he'd given us at the beginning of this year. I don't know if you remember it, I'll tell you. Number one, 2024 was a year to get our priorities lined up. Number two, alignment, alignment. And when I, see, when I say alignment, when I say that word alignment, I see myself standing on a, on a straight line, alignment, alignment. Our, our lives have got to get into alignment. But if your priorities are screwed up, you're not going to get into alignment. See, screwed up priorities damage your potential for the future. When your priorities are messed up, you're easily distracted. And right now, listen to me, this world outside of our four walls cannot afford to have a church that's distracted. We are who Jesus is using to bring some sense to this world. We are who Jesus is using to to stop the devil from chewing people up. If the church is distracted, everybody's lost. And the third word, which at the time in the beginning of the year seemed completely disconnected, but all of a sudden now things are making sense. The third word that I heard from the Holy Spirit was that this was a year of unprecedented And I don't mean unprecedented nice things. Unprecedented. 4.8 earthquake in New Jersey. It's been hundreds of years since we've had an earthquake that even comes close to that. Unprecedented. I got news for you. You better buckle your seatbelts. Now, how does that all tie in? I didn't understand it until this week. See, when your priorities are lined, when your priorities are, are lined up, and when your life is in alignment, not with well, Pastor, I have my five-year plan and I have goals and dreams. And, 
stop it. I'm talking about getting our lives in alignment with the Word of God. Amen. When your priorities are good and you're in alignment with the Word of God, unprecedented stuff can come and it's not going to shake you. Amen. But when your priorities are messed up and your life is not aligned with the Word of God and the will of God for your life, the slightest little breeze, oh my God, what's going on? Yes or no? And let me tell you something, the best way for us to build strength in our lives is to study about Jesus, Amen. is to get a fresh revelation of who he is, Amen. our rock, Amen. the foundation upon which we, are, which we stand. He is the one who brings us a grace in order for us to stand. We have to know him. Paul, Paul, who Jesus appeared to on the road to Damascus, Paul who went to Jesus so Jesus could teach him about the things that he had to write to the churches. At one point in his life, writes an entire letter based on this. I want to know him. Dear God, Paul, with all the experience that you had, if you can still make that request that I want to know him, where the heck are we? We need to know him. We don't know what's coming. These past few weeks, I keep saying this thing. It just keeps coming out of my spirit. We don't know what kind of world we're going to wake up in tomorrow morning, especially tomorrow morning. I got messages that people sent me. Are you going to talk about the eclipse? Yeah, on Wednesday. (laughs) You got enough people talking to you about them now. You listening? If you don't know, meet me in the lobby. Okay? Now, I will admit there are some really strange threads that you can pull together here. And honestly, we don't know. We don't know. So we need to prepare ourselves. Amen? Again, remember, you're the light of the world. You're the salt of the earth. All right. You ready for the message now? All right, so let's go, let's go. Let's start with this basic fundamental understanding of Jesus' eternal existence, eternal existence, okay? The Apostle John, like I talked about before, was so blessed to receive revelation of Jesus. The letter that he wrote itself, what do we call it? What do we call the letter, the last book of the Bible? What do we call it? Revelation. Revelation. That's not the word, that's not the name. The real name is Apocalypsis where we get the word apocalypse from. And apocalypse has nothing to do with a battle. It has all to do with revelation. That's why we translate it revelation. Apocalypses, I keep looking at that screen. <laughs> it means the unveiling, to pull the veil aside. And you could you just imagine yourself on that rock out in the Mediterranean, like John was, banished there by the Roman Empire because they couldn't fry him. They tried to kill him. The emperor put him in a vat full of bowling oil, and he just floated like a Zeppelin on the boardwalk. <laughs> they couldn't fry him. They couldn't kill him. Go look it up. Go look it up. Go look it up in church history, okay? So he got disgusted and said, we can't fry the guy. Send him to Patmos. And he was only there. I think most Bible teachers claim he was only there like 18 months. I don't think he was there a long time, Okay. And he gets there, and he has this vision, this open vision on that island, and Jesus appears to him in his eternal majesty, and he doesn't look anything like the Jesus at the Last Supper. And John falls at his feet like a dead man. We'll we'll talk about that more in the future, because I could go into that, but can can you go back to unveiling, unveiling. So John is there minding his own business, trying to scratch out something to eat, and he has this, and it says on the Lord's Day, which we say is what day? Mm -mm. Go look it up. I was shocked when I found it. It was on a Thursday. Because the Lord's Day in Roman culture was the day, I believe it's called Kuriakos, which fell on a Thursday. That was the day that you're supposed to burn incense to the emperor. And that's the day. Isn't that great that Jesus would appear to him? The emperor of the universe would appear to him on the day when they're supposed to burn incense to the emperor of the Roman Empire, okay? Just something to say, well, go look it up. Go look it up. All right, so the unveiling, the disclosure, the appearance 
and of course to reveal. That's what that whole book is about. And all we want to do is read it to find out who's the Antichrist, who's the Antichrist. What do you care about the Antichrist? You, if you're a Christian, you're not going to be here. If, he, if we're here and he's here, something's wrong. Because <laughs> we're, according to the scriptures, the church is the restraining power holding back the Antichrist. And he's probably alive on the earth right now, but he can't show who he is yet. Why? Because we're here. Amen. So stop reading the book to find out who he is. Read the book to find out who Jesus is. Amen. That's the whole goal of the book. Yes. Amen? Yes. Revelation chapter 1, verse 8, out of Jesus' mouth, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is and who was to come, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Amen? Yes. So he's the beginning and the end. John chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. Doesn't it sound like Genesis chapter 1, verse 1? Yes. Okay? So what is it telling us? Could it be speaking about somebody who didn't exist until Bethlehem? No. It's talking about Jesus, who always is. You'll see it some more. This is what Jesus said to the religious people. John chapter 5, verse 39. He said, you search the scriptures, for in them you think that you have eternal life. And they are they that testify of me. He's saying, you guys are constantly in your scrolls. But you don't understand that what's written there is talking about me. Well, obviously, those words are eternal. Yes or no? Yes. Okay, you'll get more of this as we go along. So Jesus declared that the Old Testament, the first covenant, is about him. And we see him all throughout that covenant. Okay? Now, let's go to John. Because I, I want to show you this. Did Jesus ever claim to be an eternal being? What? Don't answer it because you might embarrass yourself. Did Jesus ever claim to be an eternal being? Let's go to John chapter 8. Because John chapter 8 records this very lengthy. Are you learning anything? Yeah. John chapter 8 records for us this lengthy discussion that's taking place between Jesus and between the religious leaders. Amen? Now watch this now. This conversation is an extension of what happened with the woman that was caught in the act of adultery. Remember that one? Yeah. Okay, let him who's without sin cast the first stone. And all the religious people went from the oldest to the youngest. They walked away. You remember? You remember? Yeah. Okay, good. So we're going to pick up in verse 53. Now they're debating with him. Who do you think you are? They're debating with him, right? Are you greater than our father Abraham, who is dead and the prophets are dead? Who do you make yourself out to be? Look at this. Verse 54, Jesus answered, If I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my Father who honors me, of whom you say he is your God. Yet you have not known him, but I know him. And if I say I do not know him, I shall be a liar like you. But I do, not, but I do know him and keep his word. Verse 56, now he's going for their juggler vein. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Now they get triggered. Then the Jews said, no, understand, this is the religious people, said to him, you are not yet 50 years old, and have you seen Abraham? Oh, verse 58, man. Oh, my gosh. Verse 58, Jesus said to them, most assuredly I say to you, before Abraham was, come on, say it with me nice and loud, I am. I love this. When we get to heaven... Let's all meet someplace, and let's go see Jesus and say, hey, we want to see the replay. We want to see what was the look on their faces when you said, I am, okay? So watch this now. We know this impacted them, not for the good. Verse 59 says, and they took up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. Why? Because it's not his time to die yet. Going through the midst of them, so he passed by. Look it. Listen to me. It's very obvious. Watch this now. Listen to me carefully. It's very obvious that they believed that Jesus believed that he's the great I am. Now, when they heard I am, what do you think they thought of? The burning bush with Moses, okay, in the book of Exodus. The voice of the one who spoke to Moses, their hero, okay? They, would, they wouldn't have tried to stone him if they just thought he was crazy or if he was a liar. Why would you bother? Why would you risk getting arrested for somebody who you know they're crazy or they're a liar? But if you believe that that person believes it, that's a whole different story. 
So, the key verse there. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day and saw it and was glad. Well, let me ask you this question. When did Abraham see Jesus? Three different occasions. We're going to talk about the first one today. We don't have time to go into the other two. We'll go to the other two next week, okay? Do I got your attention yet? Yes. Genesis chapter 15. We're going to read from verse 2 all the way down to verse 18. So you guys back there on the screen, just keep feeding me the scriptures, okay? Verse 2. Now watch this now. Oh, man. All right, uh, you got to go back to verse 1. Genesis chapter 15. I want you to write this down. Put it in your phone. Have somebody remind you. I can see you're all taking action real quick here. <laughs> write this down. Genesis chapter 15, verse 1. Watch this now. After these things. Don't you want to ask the question? Okay. What things? After these things. Now, you're not going to. The reason I bring this up every time I teach this is you don't have a full appreciation for Genesis 15 until you find out what happened in Genesis 14. Genesis 14 is the account where Abram has got to go. Now, he's Abram now. It's not Abraham yet. He's Avram, Abram, okay? He's got to go rescue his nephew Lot, who got captured when these bunch of kings got together and attacked the area where Lot was living. Abram gets his 318 servants and goes after an army. They win. He gets all their stuff. Because back then, you, you, when you went to war, you went to war with common sense, okay? You, when you went to war back then, you took everything your defeated foe had. Not like today. We defeat people, then we spend $100 billion to go rebuild our enemies, okay? All right, that's just a sideline note there. Okay. Back then, they had common sense. So, so Abraham's like, you guys went after my nephew? Taking everything you have. Took everything he had. Now he's heading back to where he lived. He's got to pass by a place named Salem. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> what do we call it today? Jerusalem. 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 Okay? And while he passes by there, he meets a person who we're not going to talk about today, maybe someday in the future, whose name is, we call him Melchizedek, which is not really a name, it's a title. Melchizedek, King of Righteousness. Okay? There's plenty of theories about who this guy is. It doesn't matter. Abram meets this man. The man comes out of Jerusalem with bread and wine. Does that sound familiar? Okay. And he meets Abram with bread and wine, blesses Abraham, and then Abram takes 10% of all the stuff that he got from this battle, and he gives it to Melchizedek, and that triggers Genesis chapter 15. That's the things that are after. After these things, what things? Abram, in the sight of God, now qualified himself by the way he handles himself in chapter 14, qualified him for the upgrade he's going to receive in Genesis chapter 15. Was that clear? Yes. Did you get that? Yes. How about you guys over here? Okay, you got that. All right, so let's go. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision saying, do not be afraid. Now, if God shows up on the scene and he's got to say, don't be afraid, what most likely is the person experiencing? Fear. Thank you, because God doesn't waste words. Okay? Do not be afraid, Abram. Watch this now. This is extremely important. I challenge you to go home and look this up in the original language. I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. You know what God just said to Abram in the original language? You work for me now. You work for me now. With all the fringe benefits. Are you getting this? Yes. Now, I, I don't want to go into this, but I have to make note of this. Because Abram paid his tithe, now he goes to work for God. Amen. I'll say it again for those of you that just went, eh, 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 don't want to hear it, don't want to hear it. The act of Abram paying his tithe to Melchizedek, who's a representative of God, okay, qualified him now for Genesis chapter 15. Watch this. You work for me now. Now, verse 2. But Abram said, Lord God, what will you give me seeing I go childless? In other words, this is wonderful. It's great that you're going to bless me. You're going to give me all this property. You've given me all the gold. You've given me all the silver, the cattle, the sheep. My herds have increased. I've increased in man servants, maid servants. It's wonderful. What good is it? I got nobody to leave it to. 
Genuine question. Ge genuine question, no? Now, if you're sitting there going, I don't have anything, so I don't worry about it. But Abraham had some stuff. And when you have some stuff, your concern is, what value does it have if there's nobody that's going to take it and run with it and do anything with it? Amen. Valid question, no? Yes or no? Yes. Okay. He said, because the heir of my house is Eleazar of Damascus. Eleazar. In other words, you blessed me. I got all this stuff. My bank accounts are full. I own property all over the place. I've got gold, silver, herds, all this stuff. But what good is it? I'm going to end up leaving it to a stranger. Okay? And, Abram, and then Abram said, look, you've given me no offspring. Indeed, one of board in my own house is my heir. In other words, this is a stranger. He's from Damascus. He's probably not even a Jew. He's from Damascus. Okay? Next verse. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, This one shall not be your heir, but one who will come from your own body shall be your heir. What is this the first promise of? Isaac's on the way, okay? Then he brought him outside and said, Look now toward heaven and count the stars if you're able to number them. And he said to him, So shall your descendants be. Now, a little side journey here. Whenever God makes a promise to you, he always gives you something to remind you of that promise. Because I guarantee you, Every night when Abram got discouraged or when is this going to happen and started getting into doubt, what did he do? Walk outside of his tent and do what? Look at the stars, Look at the stars okay? <laughs> Next verse. And he, he, Abram, watch this now. How many, how many of you were there the time when one of your loved ones got born again? Okay. Wasn't that an amazing feeling? Yeah. Okay, we're watching Abram get born again. This is when Abram gets saved. Are you listening to me? Watch this now. And he, Abram, believes in the Lord, and he, the Lord, accounted it to Abraham as what? Righteousness. This is when Abram gets saved. People get saved in the Old Testament? Yes. They believed God, and God accredited it to them as righteousness. Are you getting this? Yes. Okay, now their spirit didn't come alive, but they got saved. Okay, so, so that, watch this now. Oh, there's another side journey. This is how people got qualified to go to paradise. You remember Lazarus, rich man? Yeah. Lazarus and rich man. Remember, yeah. they both die. Lazarus goes where? Paradise. The rich man goes where? Hades, hell, Sheol, hell, okay? All right? Now, when Jesus rose from the dead, where did he stop by? Paradise. What did he do? Emptied it out and brought them where? To heaven. So there's nobody in paradise right now. There's nobody in that compartment, but there's still everybody in hell. Okay? Because eventually that'll get emptied out too. Okay? You got that? Yeah. Right. Am I going too fast? No. no. All right. Then he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans. Okay? You say, where is that? Kuwait. You know where Kuwait is? That's where that was. To give you this land to inherit. Okay? That's wonderful. That's great. Next verse. And he said to God, to, to Lord God, how shall I know that I will inherit? In other words, uh, can we put this in writing? <laughs> Are you getting this? Because yeah. right. Abraham didn't get to be Abraham by being stupid. All right, can we put this in writing? Okay. So now watch what happens next. Now watch this now. You got to pay attention here because a lot of like, okay. So he, God, said to him, Abram, bring me a three-year-old heifer, cow. A three-year-old female goat, a three-year-old ram, a male sheep, okay? A turtle dove and a young pigeon. Okay, he's so got all these animals lined up. God's got something he's going to do here. It's going to make an impression on Abram, okay? Next verse. Then he, brought, then he, Abram, brought all these things to him, God, and cut them in two. Now, he slaughters these animals, okay? And a cow's a pretty big animal. Goat's a fairly big animal. So when you slaughter and you cut them in half, what happens? There's blood all over the place. This is a very bloody scenario here. Yeah. Very bloody scenario here, okay? You getting this? Yeah. Cut them down the middle and laid the pieces opposite the other, but he did not cut the birds in two. They're too small. They put the birds at the end of the line, okay? So now watch this now. Watch it. What has what, what what he created here? He's created this pathway. He's got half an animal on this side, half an animal on that side. Half a goat, half a goat, half a ram, half a ram, and then the little birds down the end. Now watch what happens here. I know some of you have heard me teach this already, but for the sake of those who haven't, act, act excited, okay? <laughs> Next verse. And when the vultures came down on the carcasses, so that tells us that some time went by. Well, these animals are just laying there. 
Okay? Now, why? When the vultures came down on the carcasses, Abram drove them away. What is that? Why is that in there? Because there are times when God starts to show you something that the enemy comes in and wants to spoil it. Amen. He wants to rob it. Yeah. He wants to take the reality of it away from you. What do you got to do? Get out of here in Jesus' name. Amen. Next verse. Now, when the sun was going down, watch this. It's going to get good now. A deep sleep fell upon Abram. And behold, horror and great darkness fell upon him. This is, he, he's never experienced this before. Okay, what happened? He, a deep sleep came on him. But watch this now. He's, he's, a, he can still hear. He can still see. He just cannot participate. Say that with me. He cannot participate. In other words, he cannot actively get involved in what's going to happen next. But he's there. He sees what's going on. Now, God speaks to Abram. Now, watch this now. Now, he's going to tell him the future. Know certainly that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs and will serve them, and they, the land who they serve, will afflict them for how many years? How many years were the Israelites in Egypt? He's telling them what's going to happen in the future. All right, next verse. And also the nation whom they serve, I will judge. Did God judge Egypt? Yeah. Oh, big time. Afterward, they shall come out with what? Great come on, don't be afraid to say it. They shall come out with what? Great so stop watching these stupid Hollywood movies where they have all the Jews coming out of Egypt with tattered rags. They're all emaciated. They can hardly walk. Their goats look like... <laughs> That's not what happened. They came out with the wealth of Egypt. You listening? Yeah. Next verse. Now as for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace, and you shall be buried at a good old age. Next verse. But in the fourth generation, they, the ones who went to go to Egypt, shall return here, for the iniquity of the Amorites has not come. In other words, the people that live in this land right now that I'm going to give to you, I'm still giving, you, giving them time to repent. Did they? No. That's why Joshua has to come and destroy them all years later, 400 years later. Next verse. Then it came to pass. Watch this now. You got to pay close attention to this now. Are you seeing this picture? Yeah. Picture this in your mind. There's dead animals, half on one side, half on the other side. Blood all over the place. Abram sitting on the side, maybe propped up against a tree. He, he sees and he hears, but he cannot. Participate. Let's say it again. He cannot. Participate. Okay. So, now it came to pass. When the sun went down, it was dark that behold, there appeared a smoking oven and a burning torch that passed between the pieces. Okay, I got to do this quick because it's almost 1030 already. You got to get out of here. Okay? No, seriously. Watch this now. The burning oven represents God Almighty. Hebrew says our God is a consuming fire. Guess who the burning torch is? I am the light of the world, Jesus said. This is so cool. Because could you picture it? This furnace, this burning furnace appears. And it passes through those pieces. And then the flaming torch appears. Jesus, the light of the world. And they pass each other through those things. Watch this. This is what happens in a covenant. Listen, I'm teaching on blood covenant on Wednesday nights. Just started last week. If you don't understand the blood covenant, you, don't, you haven't read the Bible because the Bible is a blood covenant, okay? When two people cut a covenant and you cut a covenant, you kill these animals, you put them side by side, you walk between them, and this is what you say to the other covenant person. You see what happened to these animals? This is what should happen to me if I break covenant with you. You're literally putting a curse on yourself. Now do you understand why Jesus had to go to the cross? Why? Because he said to the Father, if I ever break covenant with you, this is what should happen to me. Well, did Jesus break covenant? No, you did, and I did. But who was he representing at the cross? Us. We should have been the ones to be cut in half, just like those animals. But because of his love, he went on our behalf and took the punishment in other words, took the consequences of the curse of breaking covenant upon himself so that you and I could walk away free. Amen. He's so much bigger than a little baby in a manger. Amen. He's so much more than a broken body on a cross. 
He is almighty God himself. So much bigger. Now listen, we have to leave. We're way over time here. Okay, the next service starts at 11 o'clock. You know the story. I don't have to tell you. Please, if you need prayer, look at, don't go moving around yet. One second. If you have never asked Jesus Christ to be the Lord of your life, if you have never declared your faith in him, please, before you walk out those doors, come up here. There's people up here that will pray with you, lead you in a very simple prayer. Receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. Seal your eternal destination. He's coming. He's coming. And I think if we honestly knew the date and the time, it would scare the out of us. <laughs> We're that close. If you need prayer for anything else, come up. If not, God bless you. I pray that the Holy Spirit continues to reveal this stuff to you. Make sure you're here next weekend.